good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. This is a special edition of The Journey Home because tonight we're going to do something we certainly don't often get a chance to do. Tonight we'll be using technology to connect directly with a brother on the other side of the pond, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. And we're here tonight with Dr. Gavin Ashington, a former Anglican. I'm looking forward to hearing your story, Gavin, and our audience well, he understands, of course, why we're doing this, because the worldwide COVID pandemic has made it a little complicated for you to travel over here. But Gavin, I would certainly prefer to talk face to face, but I'm at least grateful that we're able to have this privilege anyway. So Gavin, welcome to the program. Marcus, thank you. Well, thank you very much for, for inviting me. I've become a huge fan. <laughs> I've, been, I've been astonished uh, to listen to the journeys of some of the people who sat in front of you and um, it's a real privilege to be to be in the queue well it's a great privilege to have you join us but before i have you start why don't you tell us tell the people where you're coming to us from yes it's rather exciting um, so uh, in the middle of england on the right hand side there's a fat bit that sticks out called norfolk or east anglia and um, in the middle ages our lady appeared in a dream to uh, to, to a woman called Richeldis here. And um, one of the very interesting things for, a Catholic, for an English Catholic is <clears throat> why there have been so few apparitions. This wasn't an apparition, it was a, it was a, a sort of a visitation, a blessing. But why have there been so few in England? Because just across the channel in, in France and Spain, um, as I was to discover, as we'll discover as our conversation goes, uh, Our Lady's been very busy renewing the church. And, um, and since this England was called the dowry of Our Lady in the Middle Ages, the, the devotion, uh, the Catholic devotion was really ran very deep and, and very powerfully. Uh, it's surprising there aren't more places like this, but it's the, there was a, in, the, in the middle, uh, about 200 miles away in the Vale of Evesham, Our Lady appeared to uh, a pig herder in about the eighth century. Uh, t to no great effect. I mean, it was just a wonderful thing to happen. Although, if you ever, if you ever go through that part, the Vale of Evesham, it just is so beautiful. You know, you, before I ever knew about Our Lady, and before I even, before I had much inkling of what real Catholicism was, opposed to the the fake Catholicism I had in my head, uh, to travel through the Vale of Evesham, you'd say, well, something rather wonderful has happened here. And I suspect it was Our Lady appearing in the eighth century. Wasn't there a reference uh, in the Canterbury Tales? of people making a pilgrimage to Walsingham? Yeah, there is. Yeah, it was quite famous even, even then. Uh, and people, people did go to, uh, to Walsingham as much as they went to Thomas Becket at Canterbury. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a very famous pilgrimage site. And, but, and I suppose the fact that there are so few places Our Lady is associated with makes it all the more special for that reason. All right. Well, uh, I wanted to make sure we mentioned that to our audience. You really <laughs> are coming to us from a very special place. Indeed. And actually uh, at an EWTN studio there in Walsingham. So, all right, then yeah. um, what I'd like to do is to take a step back. And before we find out why you eventually became Catholic, we'd like to, uh, you to take us to the beginning of your spiritual journey. Well, thank you. I, I think it was Kierkegaard who said part of the trouble about being a human being uh, is that we live our life forwards but we really only understand it going backwards. And, and I, I'm not saying that to drop, to drop names or to be clever, but only to say it's really quite difficult to understand our lives and the journey they have. And um, I'm kind of slightly embarrassed it's taken me this long <laughs> to, <laughs> to wrap my head and my heart around, uh, around as much of the reality as it has. But I'm, I've always been a slow developer, so maybe it's appropriate. Um, but I, I think it... Well, it, it began, I think, with my father. Um, my father was a barrister and he would go to work in London. I grew up in southwest London at a place called Wimbledon where they play a lot of tennis. Um, of and dad would come running back from the train station and he'd, he'd run upstairs and he'd, uh, um, uh, I'd hide from him. We'd play, drunk, we'd, we'd play dragons and then he'd flop down on his knees and he'd pray the Lord's Prayer every night. Mm. And... Um, uh, until I was 11, and he got embarrassed and stopped. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm really, I'm really sorry he got embarrassed and stopped because it was um, kind of got into my bones. Um, so early religious experiences are are 
hard to, um, they're a bit elusive, I think. But, but one of the things that surprised me when I was about nine or 10 was assemblies at school. And I thought that what happened to me happened to everybody. And again, I, I, we had a reunion of some old, bald, fat men like me uh, um, who were all at school together when we were 10 or 11. And I asked them, I said, do you remember the school assemblies? Did, did this happen to you? And they looked at me and they said, you are so weird. We have no idea what you're talking about. Because what happened to me was they, as they read from the Bible, uh, and particularly I remember Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, uh, and bits of the Gospels, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And I just got terribly excited is the wrong word. It took my breath away. And I remember just being on, on tiptoe thinking, wow. And, and the, other, the other thing that really got me was the prayer of St. Ignatius. Um, and uh, I've no idea why the headmaster used it, but it was there every single day. And it really, I, I, I simply noticed it. Um, that and, and um, uh, I was a choir boy to, at an Anglican parish church where they did things rather well. It was a very good choir. Uh, semi, semi professionals too, too, too posh, but um, the Psalms got into my bones and also music. I knew, I knew that when the music got ecstatic, that I was experiencing something of God. I, I mean, I knew it was music. I didn't make the mistake of, of, of thinking of idolatry, uh, although, although we could have a long discussion about how music <laughs> does become idolatrous in the yeah. Christian tradition. But, but it, it, it was more that, that the ecstasy and the joy that the music uh, carried with it st was strongly associated for me with the presence of God. And so I didn't seem to have much difficulty believing in him. Uh, and, and there were instinctive things. I remember watching the Anglican vicar and his curate walk around the altar once when I was about 10, I suppose, and I was at the other end of the church in the balcony. And they were walking around without any care you know, like it was like a coffee table or something. And I remember wanting to shout out saying, be careful, this is, you know, this is not the way you walk around an altar. And then I remember thinking, what, what am I going to warn them of? A, a thunderbolt? You know, no, it's not Thor. We're not worshipping Thor. The, there shouldn't be any thunderbolts, although, although remember the Ark of the Covenant. Um, so there, were, there, were, there, were, there was kind of religious furniture that I stumbled over uh, in my experience. And I think one of the things that surprised me most as I grew up was how when I came to have an evangelical conversion, which I'll, I'll describe shortly, how the fact of all that furniture, all, all, all that early experience, didn't actually make any difference. I mean, it, it was, it was um, uh, there's some miracle that has to go into the melting of the heart, which knowing about God and even having intimations of God it isn't sufficient for. In fact, I've, I, 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 looking back now, particularly, I mean, I don't want to get to the end of, I'm not getting to the end of the story, but I keep on thinking that a very good model in the Gospels is a man who was born blind. And he has to have two sessions with Jesus. So he gets the first session uh, and, 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 you know, he sees, and he sees people walking around as trees. And I would say that's my evangelical conversion. I really was healed. I really did see. I really knew about the kingdom. But but <laughs> uh, I had to have a second laying on of hands or spittle or, or for the Holy Spirit until the, the, the men walking around like trees took on their proper shape. And, and that was when I became a Catholic. So that, that's a kind of an overarching structure that I think I'd want to use from the Gospels. All right, Gavin, uh, pause there for a second. Let, let me jump in. Something um, I'd like you to talk about a bit before we move on, especially for the American audience. We're familiar here with Episcopal and Anglican churches uh, all across America. In fact, uh, there's a great variety of Episcopal and Anglican churches today. But one thing that few of us on this side of the pond realize is you're being brought up in England where the church yeah. is the state church. You were brought up going to all the different schools. You had chapel, you had curates, you had the Anglican church. Uh, but we here have no experience of our churches being connected in a part of our government or our state. That, that was the result of our nation's declaration of independence. So 
So can you describe your experience of always having the church as an understood part of your life without having had that kind of spiritual awakening? It's so strange. Something that feels like a gift and a privilege became a real problem. Um, so it's more than just a state church. I, when I was sent away to school, I was sent away to the, the school that claims to be the oldest school in the world because it has an unbroken history going back to 597 when St. Augustine of, of uh, Canterbury came. And uh, Augustine came with his mission very reluctantly, as you, as you probably know, with his 40 monks and um, uh, sent by Pope Gregory, who'd seen some very handsome slave boys in the marketplace. Who are those? Uh, they're Angles. And he said, no, no, non-Angli non said Angeli. They're not Angles, they're angels. They're, you know, what they, they, they prop, their, their parents need converting. So he sent Augustine to convert them. And then Augustine started the cathedral at Canterbury in 597. And the reason for the small history lesson is that the cathedral that the Catholic Church built had had a had a choir school and a monastic school built around it from the beginning and and that was the school that I was sent to in 1968 when I went there and it and it had never stopped being it had never stopped being a, a school so uh for for the for the pompous and the pretentious it, it claims to be the oldest school in the world for all the good that does anybody um but but the thing about it was that in order to go from one class to another uh the the, the shortcut was through the cathedral across where Beckett was killed and out the other side to, to the classroom. So, you know, we weren't supposed to, to use a cathedral for a shortcut, but of course we did. Why not? Why wouldn't you go through that beautiful building instead of because right. it was half the distance right. instead of going around it? And so as a boy, and again, I this affected some people like me, but 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 there were plenty of people who were completely unaffected by it. But as a boy growing up with this cathedral in the middle of the school where, where Beckett had been killed and Anselm had been crowned archbishop and, and, um, uh, and, and Henry VIII had sort of moved, had, had, had desolated, you, 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 you can't live in a building like that without asking questions about God. So for me, it meant that in my teenage years, I would live one year as an atheist and the other year as an adolescent Christian. I didn't know much about being an adolescent Christian, except that. You know, we went down into the bowels of the cathedral at seven o'clock in the morning and we sung prayer, prayer, uh, we sung plain song prayer book to, to incense. And mm. in terms of a numinous experience, it was, wow, well, it was it was fantastic. Um, but it again, it didn't make me a Christian. It made me uh, it, it made me a, a sensitive, musically alert old fogey at the age of 16. But <laughs> and 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 and. Um, so when I left school, uh, although the cathedral represented the, the looming probability of God in my mind, uh, I was very pleased it was the, athe the atheist year because, um, uh, because I, I wanted to try sex and drugs. And so I thought, well, this is, you know, thank goodness it's not a Christian year because that would leave me with a moral dilemma. So uh, atheist year. It's, um, and I went out to Canada. And what I didn't understand at 18 was how hard sex and drugs were to come by. <laughs> I thought I thought there'd be a great deal of easy temptation, but but not at all. But the, the reason for mentioning this part of the journey was I had one of those things that people called an NDA, a near-death experience. And I, and I know you've had people who've talked about them before on this program. Um, and what happened was I, I had a disturbing time. Uh, I... I was teaching kids on a music program and um, our, our boss was stealing our money. And because I was going to be a lawyer when I got back to start my university career, my colleagues, the other musicians said, you, you go and persuade him to give us our money. Uh, and um, my arguments didn't work very well. So I ended up shaking him by the lapels and I got the money back. But the violence, not that it was particularly, you know, I just shook him by the lapels. but. It upset me very badly, and I drank a liter of gin. Um, and the, the the thing about drinking a liter of gin, if you're not very good with alcohol, and I, I've I've never been at all good with alcohol, is that it is liable to interfere with your respiratory system. And uh, mm. so I I think that I passed out. Well, I know that I passed out. Uh, mm. I had the experience of leaving my body. This is 
this is all terribly common. There's a whole, there's a whole literature of near-death experiences. It happens to one in every 10 people or so. <laughs> but it doesn't, interestingly enough, it doesn't get talked about much in our culture, but that's another, another topic of conversation. And I, I went to judgment. Uh, and, I, and a number of things were very clear to me. Uh, lots of things weren't clear. But it was clear that I was in the presence of not light, but what created light. So, so, so light is the kind of the epiphenomenon, but, but I was in the, the thing that gave light its name or its quality. Uh, and and the, I was in the presence of something that was both singular and plural, and it loved me very much, but it was really serious. And I'd come to judgment. And I heard, I heard a, vo a verse from the book of Revelation, and I don't know why, uh, but it was, the, ver the verse was, uh, from chapter 8, this, there was silence in heaven for half an hour, yeah. which is a bit just before St. Michael takes on the, yeah. the dark angels. And I remember, and this is very strange, I remember thinking, gosh, I've come to judgment and I could be sent to hell. This is really, a, this is a very serious moment. Um, and, and a comforting thought came. If I'm sent to hell, I will have the solace of knowing that there's justice at the heart of the universe. Now, I hadn't actually done very much wrong. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd stolen a bit and I'd lied a bit. and, and um, But I'd been reasonably moral, actually. Uh, but nonetheless, I felt that I was in very serious danger of going to hell and it might happen. But that if it happened, it would be a function of justice and that, that could only be a comfort. And then the court withdrew uh, and there was silence in heaven for half an hour, or, or so it seemed. And then when the court came back, the verdict was I'd been forgiven and I'd be sent back. Hmm. Um, now, the reason I think this might have happened rather than, than my dreaming it up or, or it being a sort of failure of synapses in the brain is because um, if, I, if I ever did drink very much, I was usually feel quite ill for days. I, I, I'm just one of those people who doesn't have a tolerance for alcohol. And I had drunk a litre of gin. I saw the bottle go down and... and uh, you know, no, it wasn't gin, it was vodka, sorry. Um, I'm getting old and forgetting the details. <laughs> it was a litre, <laughs> but it was vodka. Um, and uh, as I came to in my body at about 5 a.m., it was, it was dawn uh, on, in one of the Ontario lakes. Um, I felt incredibly well. I felt really well physically. I felt well spiritually and psychologically. And all I could think of was, how do I keep this feeling? This is so amazing. And I thought... I have to forgive. I have to give what's been given to me. So a couple of hours later at breakfast, I, I stalked our boss I'd beaten up the night before in order to forgive him. He saw me coming and I, I walked towards him with my arms open wide to forgive him because I needed to keep the feeling. And yeah. he turned on his heel and walked away from me thinking I was going. So as he, I walked faster, he ran, I ran. And it, was, it, became, it, became, it became a farce. And I eventually caught him and I found myself shaking his lapel saying, I've come to forgive you. <laughs> I realized I wasn't doing it right at all. But, but behind my late adolescent naivety, there was the certainty that I had been in the presence of God. I'd been given my life back. I, I'd been forgiven and... And this was amazing. And then the, the next astonishing thing happened. Gavin, uh, and that, I want to jump in here, if I could. Uh, apologize. But I want to affirm something uh, I need to say. And that's what's exciting to me as I consider the hundreds of conversion stories I've had the privilege of hearing over the years. It's when I hear of that miraculous moment of grace that happens in a person's journey. For you, it was waking up in the morning without a hangover. There was something miraculous about that that was specifically for you. You understand what I'm saying? That was for you. Many times in the process of telling our stories of how God did something in our lives, uh, people may not understand. Their eyes may glass over. Uh, it, but, it, but you know what I'm talking about. You knew that it was God talking to you awakening you. It's like when something happens and most people just say it was a coincidence and you say, no, 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 completely. that was God. That is what I'm hearing you saying. You, you had this unique awakening from the Spirit that has changed your life. 
later on in my life, I was to become qualified in psychology and to become a psychology prof at a university. And I, it, of course, I began to get interested in new deaf experiences to teach about them because I wanted to put them in some kind of broader framework in order to make sense of my own experiences. But and I came across a lot of academics who produced reasons for proposing that these experiences are self-induced. And one of the things I'd like to say to him is you cannot self-induce forgiveness. I mean, you you know, you 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 can't self-induce a cleansed liver. <laughs> um, you know, you you cannot be sober uh, after you've been after you've been very badly drunk. But most of all, you simply can't self-induce forgiveness. Or our therapists and our confession uh, would be out of business, and our confessionals would be empty. It's it's the most fantastic gift. And I knew I had it so much that I had to make a fool of myself chasing somebody in order in order in order to. to you know, and then I understood, I understood for a moment the Lord's Prayer completely. You know, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. You have to, to, to receive it, you have to pass it on. But, but, but the other extraordinary bit about this, and, I, and it, I guess it reflects quite badly on me, is that uh, within days my life had got so exciting and dramatic that I simply forgot about God. Uh, I, 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 I won't go into the personal details. I, I got heavily diverted by things that mattered to me. <laughs> And it was as if, it wasn't as if it was a dream, but it was as if it was last week and didn't matter anymore. Um, and I went on with my life. I, I went to university. I started training to be a lawyer. And then halfway through, I hit a real crisis and I couldn't solve it. There was a lot of pain, difficulty, darkness, despair. And the back of my brain, something went, what happened last time you had a real crisis? And I went, oh, yeah, God. Well, wouldn't it be useful if you found him again? Oh, yes, it, that would be very, that would be useful. <laughs> so I went on a search for God and um, I went to the local Anglican church. I went in, uh, it was Matins, it was 1975, it was very formal. I thought, but I know this, this is what I grew up with. This is, I'm, I'm not, I didn't meet him here when I was, you know, I had, I had glimpses of him, but but I, I mean, I really need him now. This is This is not just... Mm -hmm. Glimpses, liturgy, morality, community. This is, I need God. Uh, I need him to, to solve, to fix things. Uh, I need an intervention. Um, and on my way out of the, uh, the church, I, the, 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 the vicar, Anglicans are very good at shaking hands with people as they go out of church. It's one of the things they do <laughs> really well. And, and, if, and if I'm not flattering enough towards Anglicanism in the course of any part of this conversation, let me say straight away, there are a number of things they do really, really well. And uh, pastoral care by the clergy and shaking hands is one of them. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I said, <laughs> I, I said I've come to discover God. But I said, I'm, I'm very sorry, but he's not here. And the vicar took a step backwards and said, well, how do you know? And I said, I know. <laughs> I've, I've met him. I know he's not here. <laughs> and he said, well, maybe we should talk about it. So we had a conversation later on in the week and he said, you need to be born again. And I said, well, yeah, maybe. And he said, well, you know, you do. He said, I'm just a midwife. I can't make it happen. But there's a, a famous evangelist who's coming to the university actually next week as it happens, because in God's timing, everything is neatly arranged. Uh, and um, if you're really serious, you know, I, I don't mind you telling me you can't find God in my church, but, but, but you go and put yourself in front of this evangelist and see what happens. So um, I went down and then it was a, a fascinating thing happened. He was speaking in the cathedral of the, the city I was in. And on the way down to listen to him, four groups of friends met me. I mean, I, I bumped into them. And the first group said, hey, it's Ginny's 21st birthday party. Where are you going? I'm going to the cathedral here in Evangelist. Don't be such an idiot. It, you know, there's a lot of free booze. This is going to be a great party. No, no, I'm, I've got to go. OK. Then the next group there was a very famous string quartet that played music in the uh, university. And they said, this quartet's playing Beethoven's late quartets. It's free. This doesn't often happen. You've got to come. This is, you know, they'll be writing about this for years. And I said, you know, where are you going? I'm going to the cathedral here in Evangelist. You're mad. Don't, don't be so stupid. <laughs> Well, by the time the third group came, even I had got the picture and I went, oh, OK, so someone doesn't, someone does, <laughs> someone or something doesn't want me to go. I went there and I listened to this man talking about Jesus. And, and I'm probably the end of the last generation to say this, but most of us were really terrified by Billy Graham. 
we thought that you Americans had a, had a kind of brainwashing technique for religion. And Billy Graham was, was the man who did it. And you just had to be careful not to be brainwashed. And <laughs> it, it, caused, it caused evangelicalism or evangelism in our country some difficulty. So I listened with great skepticism in case I should be brainwashed. I mean, God knows if you'd asked anybody, how do you think brainwashing happens? And how do you think it can happen through somebody talking to, you know, there isn't a rational or sane answer. But, uh, but of course, we're talking, the human experience is not just intellectual, or cultural, or social, it's also spiritual. And there's always a spiritual anti-force at work, uh, which is where I think many of these semi-conscious apprehensions come from, you know, you'll be brainwashed, don't listen. That was you know, that's a voice I've now come to recognize very well in later life. However, uh, as he talked about Jesus and he presented Jesus in a very coherent way, I heard him presented as the light. Great. I know what the, I know what the light of God was like as a truth. Mm. I'd bumped into the truth as the mercy. I knew about the mercy as the way I needed the way as the life. I needed the life. And I thought, do you know, there's a very I, I was so stupid, but there we are. I thought there's a very real possibility that this Jesus has got a lot to do with the God who met me, knew me, judged me, forgave me and gave me my life back. Maybe. But, but there was a slight disappointment because in the 1970s, it would have been much cooler to end up a Buddhist or a Muslim. And, and when I went, when I went, because I, I, I had begun by deciding, well, I'll work my way through the major religions, but I'll start with the Christians at the end of the road. So part of me thought, well, this is completely, this is really uncool. But on the other hand, part of me thought, well, maybe I found him. So be, because I was training to be a lawyer, I thought, well, let's, let's use the balance of probabilities. On the balance of probabilities, Jesus probably is it. So now what do I do? Well, I'll convert, but only for 48 hours. I will live as a Christian for 48 hours. I'll say my prayers. I will stop looking at women out of the corner of my eye on the street and um, uh, which is, you know, how I needed to clean my moral act up and, and then we'll review it. And so for some considerable period of time, every 48 hours, I would stop and I'd say to myself, how's it going? And I would say, well, he's, he's not let you down yet. It's, I began to read the Bible, go to church to love him. It was the early days of the charismatic movement. So I found myself baptized in the Holy Spirit and you know, in, involved in the whole kind, the whole semi-Pentecostal thing. So I was born again, uh, blessed by the Spirit, and I followed Jesus, and that was great. Uh, I was, you know, I, 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 and then, I mean, to my horror, the bit that wasn't great was when my local Christian community said, "We think you'll go, you should be an Anglican priest," and I had not been, I, I'd been underwhelmed by the Anglican <laughs> clergy I'd met. I have to say, since I met some amazingly wonderful Anglican clergy, heroic figures, but at the time, I hadn't been blessed with meeting them. And I badly wanted to be a lawyer. My father had been a lawyer. I just spent uh, some, a lot of time and effort qualifying uh, at the university. Um, however, uh, I had to be a priest. It was, it was, I mean, looking back, I can see why, but, but it, it was difficult. So I, I then set about training to be an Anglican priest, but I decided as, as a kind of the last, the last, um, they said, we'd like to send you to Cambridge to be a theologian. And, and I said, well, I, I don't want to do that. I'm, I either want to be a, a, a very devout Anglo-Catholic or a spare no punches evangelical because there are three tribes in, in, in Anglicanism in England, the, the Anglo-Catholics. Oh, Gavin, I'm sorry, uh, but I think we need to break there. Uh, as you know, we always take a half minute, a, a halfway through break in the Journey Home program, so I need to do that. But I don't want you to lose that thought. You are indeed found our Lord Jesus Christ, praise God. And now the question is, are you going to become a priest? <laughs> yes. And then if so, are you going to sign on to become a high Anglican, a high Catholic Anglican or a Lord Church Evangelical. We'll pick up on that when we come back in just a moment.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest tonight is Dr. Gavin Ashington. And Gavin, I really interrupted you in the middle of your journey um, when you were just about ready to tell us which direction you were going to go if you decided on the priesthood. Well, partly because of my, my, my life as a boy in the cathedral, I had a strong sense of the importance of the sacrament and of the Eucharist. Um, having the Eucharist celebrated with real transcendence in the cathedral was, was a very powerful experience. So I was finding myself with access to all three Christian traditions, the Catholic, the charismatic, and the evangelical. Um, in the end, I couldn't afford the train fare to the Catholic Anglo-Catholic seminary, and, and the evangelical one paid my fare, I think, and, and um, I ended up there. In the middle of seminary, I was seconded to a Greek Orthodox monastery, for a period of time, and that had a very profound effect on me, and again, laid some theological groundwork for what was to come later on in terms of my journey into the Catholic Church. So I was, I suppose I would say I was, I was theologically trilingual, um, yeah. and that's quite useful, um, but the problem was the Church of England is, um, I don't mean to be rude to it, but, it, but it's a bit like a psychiatric yeah. patient with a multiple personality disorder. It has these personalities, and, and they're rich and very interesting personalities, yeah. but it doesn't get to stitch them together. So, you know, the Anglo-Catholics hang together, the Evangelicals hang together, Charismatics swing both ways a bit, but nonetheless, they're still a, they were a group on their own. And uh, it, it was, you could do it as a matter of personal integration, but you couldn't find yeah. anywhere in the church to belong. And, and that, in, in a way, I always knew as an Anglican that I was in some kind of um, composite experimental ecclesial th event. Um, I, I had, a, I had a, 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 one, a man who was my bishop once, when there was a crisis, he said, okay, this, this, this crisis represents the end of the 500-year-old ecumenical experiment that was the Church of England. And although that's a bit harsh, I think that's exactly right. It was a kind of uh, an ecumenical experiment in spiritualities. Um, I, I, however, uh, my own journey, I, I, I then spent 10 years as a parish priest. I, I did some more academic work. I, I found myself with, with four degrees, including a PhD. And I then, uh, I asked the Lord, I, 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 I wasn't a very good parish priest. Um, uh, I was okay, the church grew, but, but people were converted, which was, I mean, there were quite quite a few people were wonderfully born again, and and that was very exciting. Um, but I really wanted to be in a university. I'd, I'd found Christ in a university, and I wanted to go back there to represent Him. And so I spent twenty three years as a university chaplain and as a member of faculty at one of our most progressive universities. And uh, and then I then I went off the rails a little bit. I. Uh, I was having real difficulty dealing with evil. Um, I had experienced evil, I mean raw evil, um, the, the demonic side, on a number of occasions, um, particularly, for example, the first time I was asked to get, give up and give my testimony. Uh, and um, those people who know what I'm talking about will understand that the, the horror of being enveloped by evil, which always has two aspects at least to it. One is despair and the other is accusation and, and hopelessness. Um, but I hadn't been able to, I hadn't been able to develop sufficient discernment and, and, and within, the, within the church I was in, the resources weren't there. Whatever the reasons were, I found it easier to take a cowardly route because uh, the great enemy evangelistically in university was Sigmund Freud. Yep. So most of my atheist colleagues that I wanted to, 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 to tussle with on behalf of God were essentially influenced by Freud to some extent or the other. Now there's Freud, there's post-Freud, there's post-post-Freud, there's three times Freud, and there's counter-Freud, you know, it's, it's an industry. But, but nonetheless, um, your si and of course he has a whole series of colleagues, Marx, and Durkheim, Feuerbach, uh, but you're dealing essentially with, with him at the root of things. Um, and the great weapon against Freud was Jung, was Carl Gustav Jung. And Jung was very useful to me because if you embrace his idea of the shadow, 
you don't have to deal with evil anymore. He does this kind of three card trick or this sidestep. And um, because I had, because I just hadn't, very hard to explain really. Um, I, I hadn't found a way intellectually, spiritually, uh, philosophically of managing to deal with these outbreaks of evil that I came across from time to time, both personally and in the lives of people who came to me. So I became a Jungian and, and it worked quite well. Uh, it, it did indeed work. Uh, and again, there were some wonderful conversion stories. One girl came into the chapel on one Sunday by mistake, thinking it was a cinema, cinema and she heard, like St. Francis and St. Anthony, she heard the words of the gospel as she stood at the top of the stairs so, and they cleaved her heart in two and, and she, she was, well, Jesus was real to her yeah. at that moment. There was another wonderful American postgraduate economist who joined a group I ran called Skeptics Anonymous and I very nearly threw him out. He was so irritating. And then um, uh, he phoned me up six months later and say, you know, Gavin, last night, Jesus appeared to me in the middle of the night. I was baptized mm. in the spirit. Everything you said is true. I'm phoning to, you know, so there was, there was a, stuff happened for the kingdom, which is great. However, um, it, it was evil, essentially, again, that drove me into the Catholic Church because I had two very strange experiences. And I still don't know why, except, of course, that the, the Lord takes everything and, you know, um, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord. St. Paul quite rightly encourages us. And, um, and the first one was, I was in a chapel in France dedicated to St. Michael at Le puy en velay and, I'm, and the, I'm a bit of a donatist, so I'm quite interested in the quality of the priests who celebrate the liturgy. Uh, and, and, and I know I shouldn't be, but, but um, uh, I'll save it up for my next confession. Uh, but on the way up to this wonderful uh, uh, ancient chapel, I bumped into the priest who was celebrating and I looked into his eyes and I thought, oh, you're good. I'll enjoy this. Great. We, and um, so this is ancient chapel up on a kind of stalactite. And in the middle of the liturgy, I thought I'd had a stroke. I, I suddenly was unable to hear the words of the liturgy. I felt a deep oppression. And as I look, okay, I didn't look above me, but, but as I looked above me without looking above me, I saw a, 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 um, a cloud of, of bats or what looked like bats um, coming down what looked like a plug hole aiming for my head. And I mean, they weren't bats, they were demons. Um, and uh, they were terrifying. <laughs> they were so terrifying, I had to take a very deep breath and not run out of the chapel screaming. I thought, this is going to require some courage, because not only were they frightening and black and heading for my head, but, but they brought with them despair and accusation. You know, I couldn't get out of my head. This is your fault. You deserve this. Um, and, and so there's another part of my bread head that stayed clear. And I thought, well, this is very interesting. I wonder, I, I wonder what's brought this on and I wonder what's going to happen. So half of my brain was freaking out and saying, get me out of here, this is terrible. And the other half of my brain says, no, this is extremely interesting. <laughs> and so the mass continued and I thought, you know, what are these, what are they doing here? This is dedicated to St. Michael. And of all places, they, you know, this is the mass. And it's, it's St. Michael's Chapel. They have, you know, how did they get in here? This is not allowed. In, in my theological world, this should not be allowed. And then the priest, the priest invoked the Holy Spirit of the elements. And I thought, you know, at some point, these blighters are going to go. And I'm very interested to see when it is. And it wasn't then. And then he, he raised the elements. And I thought, that should see them off. But it didn't. Uh, you know, they were still going for my head. And the despair and the panic was still there. Uh, and I, I walked forward to take the Eucharist and I put my hands out and the, the host was put into my hands and I thought, now, surely, nothing. And then the host touched my tongue. And as it touched my tongue, it was like someone turned a television program off. Everything cleared. They went. That was it. And I went, okay, it's the host. It's the host. And, and that, that set me on the, on, on the path of beginning to read up about the Eucharistic miracles. Because the trouble with my theological training as an Anglican was we were told, well, on the one hand, you've got Zwingli. On the other hand, you've got Aquinas. And, um, uh, you know, and how do we know? Who, who's to know? So you, you take your preferred theological opinion. Um, and uh, I 
I came across the, the Eucharistic miracle in Buenos Aires of 1994, and when I read about that and the scientific work that was done on that, I was blown away. And that began to make me feel like I'd always wondered whether or not mm. apostolic I curi was true. That, you know, that, that when Pope Leo XIII said, sorry guys, we know you mean well and you work very hard for the kingdom and you're very good pastors, but you may not have what it takes to celebrate mass. And mm. this had haunted me for 40 years because it might be true. And then the other thing that happened was I, I had another terrible experience. One night, the room, my, my, the wall of my bedroom disappeared and hell flowed in. And um, uh, I, I, I got no sleep. I contacted a friend of mine who was a Catholic exorcist. And I said, I don't think I'm going mad, but let's assume I am. Uh, but if I'm not, what do I do? And he said, you pray the rosary. And I said, yeah, you know, Mary. I, I think Mary is a psychological device for Anglo-Catholic clergy who've got mother problems. I'm really not sure I want to pray the rosary. Uh, and he said, well, you've got to choose between the rosary or, and what's coming through your bedroom window at night, my, my dear boy. And so I began to pray the rosary. And on the third night, it went away. And, and my wife said, what's that smell? And, and I, I had a bicycle accident once when I was younger, and I can't smell very much. And I... I said, what is it? She said, it's roses. Why is the room full of roses? I said, well, I, I know my medieval theology. It, it's, it's because Our Lady's here. And she said, well, I'm glad she's shown up. You've been clacking those beads for three <laughs> nights. It's about time something happened. And so I then began to look at the apparitions of Our Lady, and uh, I came across a very exciting one in 260 with, um, uh, with, a, with a, a, a bishop in Asia Minor uh, who was having a real crisis. And Our Lady in St. John appeared. Um, and uh, to, to give him some theological uh, solution to his theological problem and some encouragement. And, um, uh, and suddenly, you know, all the way through history, Our Lady is appearing. So not only does, it, does Our Lady, does, does the Rosary have the power to dissolve the demonic energies as they come at us, but, but, but she's constantly there, rather like a kind of sec second second stage John the Baptist calling the church to a deeper repentance. And so there came a point when uh, I was on the verge of becoming a Catholic uh, because I had discovered that I, I, I didn't want to take any risk of, of my Eucharist not being the Lord. I, I, I needed the real Jesus too badly to do, with, to do with an empty, to do with a placebo. And I did fear that, that, that the Anglican Eucharist might be a very a very well-meaning placebo, but you know, there, there comes a point, uh, even in medical studies, where you need the real medicine. And uh, some Anglicans, the, we were then in the middle of a cultural crisis in Anglicanism to do with feminism, the ordination of women, the whole LGBT plus thing. And I, I had slowly, I, I, I'd started off by being in favor of the whole LGBTQ plus, mainly because of, of Jung, and Jung, Jung sets up a a psychological and a philosophical framework that makes the the uh, interrelationship between opposites part of the journey of in, for into towards integration, and so uh, it provides a kind of um, ideologically uh, hospitable environment for the way in which we're experimenting with gender and sexuality. Um, but but. I was becoming convinced that there was something fraudulent about the way it was being presented. And, uh, and, and so I slowly found my way down a more traditional Catholic route as, you know, well, if you, if you, have, if you have mass in one hand and Our Lady in the other, the moral issues begin to fall into place. <laughs> you, begin to see, you begin to see them for what they are. And um, a, a group of Anglican Americans asked me if I would accept Episcopal ordination in order to, to try and create a, a, a residual uh, Anglican remnant as the Church of England was going to become increasingly heterodox uh, and heretical. Uh, and it seemed to me that this was an honourable, uh, slightly crazed, very eccentric, but, but you know, anything to rescue our Lord's sheep. What, you know, <laughs> would this rescue some sheep? Let's do it. Um, but but after after a few years as a missionary bishop for this traditional Anglican ecclesial group in America, uh, there were about five or six traditional Catholic Anglican groups 
sort of vying, ju just like America in the 1980s. We already knew that what you'd done in the 1980s, you know, we needed, we knew we knew you needed to learn the lessons and not make the mistakes. Um, and but I very, and, you know, I said to everyone, look, we know what we, we know what not to do. You know, we don't do ego, we don't do schism, we don't we don't do conflicting interpretations of the Bible. We stick to tradition. But the fact is that without a magisterium, you can't deliver that. And I very quickly realized that what I'd been asked to do uh, was not just impossible, but doomed to failure without a magisterium. You have to have the mind of the church forged by the Holy Spirit with cooperative intelligence through his tested by history. And, and we didn't have it. So, um, uh, so about that point, my local Roman Catholic bishop said, I, I've been writing a lot and, and talking a lot and sounding more and more like a like a Catholic, um, my local Catholic bishop said, "Look, actually, we've got we've got a culture war in the Catholic Church too. We, I could use you in my diocese. Would you please come over?" <laughs> um, and uh, to my astonishment, I I, I I I I looked in my heart, and I had there was no reason for saying no. I, I mean, I he said, you know, when he said, I know you're a Catholic. When are you going to convert? And I said, well, you know, maybe maybe a bit like Constantine at the last possible moment. <laughs> I, I, you know, he said, well, well, but but please, would you convert now? We'd be glad to have you on the team. And 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 the, it was as if the Holy Spirit said, that's what you're waiting for. That's it. Do it. And so I, I said yes. And then I had some explaining to do to my <laughs> Anglican friends, who I have to say, most of whom have not been very pleased about uh, it. <laughs> I want to talk about that in a moment, but before we go to that, uh, you're not celibate. No, I have a wife. <laughs> you came in with another half. Did, did your Absolutely. wife also come with you in the journey to the church? Well, she, she, she did better than that. I really should have given her the credit, but, but, but there is, there's only so much time. Um, so something very interesting happened. Uh, I've got a lot of Anglican clergy, several uh, who are talking to me at the moment about following me. Very many of them have got said, but my wife won't come. My wife is a Baptist or my wife finds this difficult. It's a, it's a thing. Uh, we could discuss why it's a thing, but that's another story. Uh, in my case, it was reversed because my wife's of a higher moral caliber and spiritual sensitivity <laughs> than I am. And she said about 2015, she said, I want to become a Catholic. And I, I got ridiculously cross. I mean, in, inappropriately and improperly cross. And I, I read her the riot act. I said, you know, marriage is two people, one flesh, doing the same thing, agreeing, you know, what are you doing? And she said, well, look, the problem is I know the presence of God. I've been following you around, listening to your sermons now for some time. <laughs> and whenever we, go, whenever we go into an Anglican church, he's not there. And whenever we go into a Catholic church, he's there. And we're getting on now, and I'm not prepared to spend my life in places where God mm. is not. I was very rude to her. I said, how presumptuous of you. How do you know your discernment is right? You know, uh, and, and I, I, uh, I mean, I now, I now, I have, I have this notion that we all get a little bit demonized from time to time. I have this image of a marionette with little filaments, you know, the, the, the devil manages to get little filaments of string attached to bits of us and he tweaks us. And we know he's tweaking us at the most moments when we get irrationally angry or irrational, you know, real irrationality is very often, I think, a function of demonic interference. I don't mean possession. Possession hardly ever happens, but there's a there's a sliding scale of interference, and and uh, and I was very badly tweaked and gave her a hard time, and she she then went quiet for two years, and then two years later she came back and said, "Okay, you gave me a hard time, but I need to become a Catholic," and so one of the things we did was we we she said you were very mean to me last time don't do that again <laughs> and so i said okay we we will go to cat to mass together at 9 30 and we'll go to the anglican eucharist at, at 11 30. and we did that for over a year and a strange thing happened i, I had a kind of um, uh, um uh, an imaginative daydream i won't call it a vision but you know there's, there's a category i can't find the right word for when you you see things in your mind's eye and in my mind's eye, as I reflected on our going to these two liturgies, the, Catholic, the altar in the Catholic Church where we were going to grew and grew and grew until it was about 45 feet high in my mind's eye. It just grew. It filled the place. 
And in my mind's eye, the Anglican Eucharist, where it was run by a friend of mine, a very holy priest in his 80s, who mm. preached a mean sermon, said his prayers. I mean, he was, he was one of those holiest Anglicans I've ever known. But in my mind's eye, the, the altar, I mean, he didn't believe in, in, in the Mass, of course, but the altar diminished and diminished. So when I kind of, on a Saturday night, I, I got ready to think about the next day, in my mind's eye, we'd be going to this place with a 45-foot altar that filled the church, or we'd be going to this place where it was like a foot. And I thought, why, why is that? Why? And, and I mean, now I think I understand that the Lord was sacramentally giving me an insight into, uh, into the fact that, that he did his business in one place in, in that particular way. Um, and, um, and again, I don't mean to be rude to, to Anglicans, but the fact is, I mean, there are, you know, Anglicans don't want to celebrate the Mass. They do not want the priest to offer a propitiatory sacrifice. <laughs> they do not want the body of Jesus uh, in, in a bleeding host. <laughs> it's not the deal. Uh, and they don't get it. But, I, but you know, increasingly, f for many of us, we want the real thing and we're not prepared to wait any longer. Gavin, we've got two minutes. And I'd like to pose a question to you. Uh, let's assume that there's an Anglican watching right now, or that one of our, vi our viewers has a friend who's an Anglican, what would you say is the key place to start to cut through all the stuff to help an Anglican hear the issue of the Catholic Church? I, 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 I'd like to say three things, because I think there are three dimensions we operate in. We operate in, in history and rationality and in the spirit. And, and, and history is a problem for Anglicans because we think we're Catholics because we got all the buildings and, and we wear the clothes. But it isn't true and it's confusing. Uh, rationality is a problem because um, the brain needs to serve the heart, not the other way around. And we live in a culture where we've always put the brain first. There's a wonderful orthodox saying about our goal being to stand before the real God with the real self, with the mind in the heart. And getting the mind into the heart is no easy thing. And Anglicanism actually reverses, the, reverses that as a matter of theological principle. I would say do, I'd say three things. Start praying the rosary. Even though you don't understand it, and you may have reasons not to do it, do it. it, it for, you will hear so many people tell you it is the most powerful thing in your hands and heart. Just do it and leave the rest to Our Lady. She's very powerful. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the first miracle at Cana started because Our Lady got on the case. And, and, you know, the first sign, the Lord saw the glory. And second, so, so um, pray the rosary, uh, revisit history. The, what the devil does is he puts false history and, and false narratives in our head. Do not believe the narratives in your head. Uh, they may not be reliable and they're often inflated by the other side to deceive you. So at least have that hypothetically. Pathetically. And the third thing I'd say is ask the Holy Spirit what he wants you to do. Because, because it, this is not a competition to, to, to gain team members. Um, we're all on a journey. And, you know, I couldn't have taken my steps 10 years ago. And it wouldn't have been very helpful to make me feel guilty or inadequate. Uh, there's a right time for the Holy Spirit to bring you home. But do not spend longer away from, away from the Mass, away from absolution, away from the saints, away from the angels. There's a wonderful phrase of, of Newman's. When he was received, he pulled down, or he pulled down Augustine and Anselm off the shelves and he, and he kissed them and said, we belong together at last. And, and that, you know, and, and everything that happened before the Anglican Church got dementia in 1520, it's all yours. You can have a one and a half thousand years of the community of the saints. You just need to take the first step. <laughs> well, Gavin, what a pleasure this has been. Thank you very much. I wish we had more time. Maybe we can pick up again, I don't know, some other day. We can make that link over the ocean to talk a bit more about uh, what you've been doing in the church now that you've come home. But God bless you, my friend. And thank you very much for uh, sharing your journey. And then all of you watching, I hope that Gavin's witness has been an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week.